Salam kare gain alwe, kare gain alwe, kare gain alwe. My very first journey on the sea was before I was even one year old. It was probably the longest journey I've ever done by sea from New Zealand back to England. I've been sailing now for, I would think, 40 years, and I started sailing in earnest in 1973 down on the River Tamar, racing a small dinghy called a mirror. A lot of people start sailing in these small little dinghies. From there, it became uh, more of a business rather than actually a hobby, so I started teaching sailing. My next really major journey was delivering, help deliver a yacht from Plymouth down to Greece, just before I started work with uh, what is Falcon Sailing. The company needed to explore for new locations. And they lent me one of their wayfarers. Um, so it was called actually Leon One. And I sailed then single-handed around the Peloponnese of Greece, a, a journey of some thousand miles. I actually found quite a few locations for the company. It was with that journey, I think, that uh, gave me the confidence to take on this larger journey, the 4,000 mile journey, which then took in some parts of the Peloponnese, which I've done before, but then took on some much more adventurous stuff, crossing the Mediterranean, and then the River Nile, which is a separate challenge on its own. Thinking about the parts of the journey that I did on my own, single-handed, um, the very first part was from the beginning at Nidri here in Lefkas, uh, heading south to the southwestern corner of the Peloponnese. And that route was a familiar route, I'd done it once before, so it was uh, going back to familiar territories, taking me down to the island of Kefalonia, through Zakynthos, and then across to the mainland. And then there's a beautiful area of um, about 30 miles of pure sand beach going down the coast to another little harbour. And then little coastal hopping basically, each day nibbling off about 10, 15, 20 miles. And it's been rather enjoyable. Well, Jules joined the journey in uh, Finicunda in the South Peloponnese. And our journey then was to skip across the southern uh, capes of the southern Peloponnese and then we came to a lovely little island called uh, Elephonisos and then headed uh, south to Kithera where we caught our first fish. It's not a very big fish, in fact I only caught two fish over the whole journey but anyway that was the first one. From Kithera we went down to a very small island called Antikythera. It's sort of halfway between the Peloponnese and uh, northern Crete. Very sloppy. It's usually a pretty stormy uh, area of uh, the Mediterranean and in fact we was, got stuck on Antikythera because of uh, strong winds and storms. And then, when that particular winds pattern sort of faded past, we thought, okay, the forecast for the next day seemed very good, force four to five. And so we thought the sort of 25 miles or so across to a little tiny island called Gramboza off the northwest coast of Crete would be a really nice sail. But in fact, it turned out to be our worst. <laughs> We left at 7 o'clock in the morning to get out of the harbour area, ready to catch the first winds of the day, but they never came. And we rode and rode 
and road in sweltering heat 25 miles with absolutely not a breath of wind but the next part was a screaming run down the west coast of Crete fantastic winds force five to six and that was probably one of our fastest passages <laughs> From there, we got our first taste of the southern coast of Crete. Gusty, calm waters in one sense, flat, not very big wee waves as such, but really strong gusty winds. eventually got to Matala which is about the halfway point across the southern coast of Crete and there we had to actually pull the boat up onto a beach it was where the famous caves where all the sort of it was so-called hippies hanged out in the 60s they would live in these little caves of Matala and that's where Jules left the first section of her journey with me <laughs> The second part of the journey alone was uh, from Matala in southern Crete, heading along the south coast of Crete, heading eastwards towards a town called Irapita. So I remember several times I was stormbound and I had to wait one or two days, sometimes even three or four days in a location before the winds abated. I remember very clearly climbing up in my spare time right up to the top of one of the mountains nearby and looking over the cliffs and then looking down at the absolute turmoil of sea below me and knowing quite well that it was a good decision to stay on the beach that particular day and then wait for the winds to abate before one would take off the next bite of the journey. Laurie joined me at Irapita and I'd been there for over 20 days and to be honest with you every day was windy, dust flying everywhere and I often looked out to the sea and thought hmm this is going to be a really adventurous sort of section. We then re-entered Greece at the island of Chrissy for the night so we could get ourselves together, unpack the boat, get things sorted out, repack it and then get ready for the big off to Alexandria. Okay, the sort of stuff that we took uh, were the most important things um, uh, were the navigational equipment. So I had charts of all, all the sea areas that I was traveling in, um, compasses, the trailing log, which gave us uh, the ability to know how far we'd traveled. In the back of the tank here, we had the big tent, which would only come out if we were in a harbor. That was quite bulky because it was made of canvas. We had um, blow up sort of lilos, but they were also canvas ones. They were quite hardy and they would roll up and they would be tucked in here as well to keep dry. We had sleeping bags, of course. One of the most important things we had was a waterproof um, little ghetto blaster, stereo, tape recorder and music so we could listen, listen to the world service and have music on the way and things like that. That used to strap just under here, away from the spray. On the very first night at sea, after leaving the coast of uh, Crete and the little island of Chrissy Island, um, the prevailing winds met from both ends of Crete and about 60 or so miles off the coast. You get very confusing waves. I remember very well, Laurie was sailing at the time and I was resting down in this sort of side. I think I was just sort of sort of resting like this. And Laurie's expression was my look on my face because I looked, I saw this huge wave coming up from above his head, curling right above him. And I sort of quickly said to him, rogue wave, rogue wave. And he looked and quickly, very beautifully steered down the face of the wave. 
but the wave crashed on the back of the boat and we got about this much water in the boat which uh, with the self bailing cockpit there are automatic bailers that suck the water out when we're doing um, a fairly good speed but even so the water level was uh, way up in the boat which we had to sort of get that was our first real sort of yeah that was a close call once we got through that it flattened right off as we got away from the uh, confused sea we had just brilliant sailing um, great music good food today's special menu chinese special sweet and sour sauce together with very special Beef stewy type corn dog. The year, the year before, uh, I'd done an Atlantic crossing and I just remembered that uh, when we got across the other side after three weeks of sailing, uh, I could hardly walk through not exercising enough. So I'd said to Steve, it's really quite important that we move around a bit in the boat. Had you mentioned the toast wrap bee day? Oh, well, no, I don't know if we should really. <laughs> One of the questions that came up um, from some school kids once was, how do you go to the toilet? We devised a system called the toast strap bee day. <laughs> and uh, we have toe straps, which are straps here, which uh, we use when we're sailing to hook our feet under, to sort of, uh, to get our weight further out on the ship. And if you could just imagine that if you get into this position, then you can get into a position where um, going to number twos is possible. Um, and then, obviously, when it came to uh, cleaning oneself, I'm gonna drop you in the water like that. Drop me in, <laughs> and that was our B day. <laughs> for a litre and a half, sir. I think that'll be enough. Just over a pound a litre. Certainly very good to me. When we did look at the the log trying to work out how far we travelled we said we must be close to the North African coast you know it can't be far away but we saw nothing and then all of a sudden we just saw that in the haze these the tops of buildings we thought well, that's, that's a city Alexandria Africa Egypt and then uh, Shortly before we got to uh, Alexandria, uh, we had to clean ourselves up. We had a load of water left over, so we really spruced up. We had yeah, shaves and got shave. into a company uniform, the whole works. New shirt, new shirt on, new shorts. And when we arrived in uh, Alexandria, at the, the Royal Yacht Club there, when we arrived, they couldn't believe it because we walked off as if we'd just been on the boat for five minutes for a little jolly round the harbour. And they said, where have you come from? We said, well, Greece. They said, in that? And we said, passports, <laughs> immigration, you know. We said, yes, here we are. Before we knew it, we were invited to the Commodore's uh, location in the Yacht Club and for tea and cucumber sandwiches. I seem to remember, just before he was off on a race. It was rather grand and rather ragey. It's very good fun. <laughs> I met Sammy, uh, who was going to be my next crew member, um, in the yacht club down in Alexandria. He was a keen young Egyptian guy and uh, uh, he was really keen to have a little part of the journey and come with me and it was invaluable because obviously he was Egyptian and with his language which helped me so much uh, get into the Nile. We sailed uh, in the morning across uh, the Great Bay there in towards the entrance of the western 
exit of the River Nile in the Delta, the Rosetta entrance. And it's interesting, we got there sort of um, late afternoon and the seas were just a nice big rolling swell and you couldn't really easily identify where the entrance of the River Nile was because um, it all looked like palm fringed edges and desert sand dunes and things. And there was a little fishing boat that was out fishing and uh, Sammy shouted over to him and uh, asked him, where's the entrance of the Nile? And he said, okay, follow me. And so we could hear this chug, 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 chug of this little, little boat in front of us. So he was only about 20 meters in front of us when all of a sudden he disappeared. Literally the boat vanished, almost as if it was swallowed by the sea. And of course we hadn't realized that this was now the breaking waves to get into the River Nile. And he'd literally just gone off the face of a wave into the trough. And before we knew it, we were facing the same fate and we just literally went head first down the face of a wave into a trough. Then we saw him again, rise up over the next wave and in over the next crest. And the beauty of the entrance of the Nile was before us, which was absolutely stunning. It was just blue water, white sand beaches, and then in front of us, about 200 meters ahead, was beautiful green palm fringed edges. So the first evening on the Nile, we'd gone no more than a mile into the river, dropped anchor, got the tent up, and made our first meal and Sammy's first experience of camping out, you know, on a small boat. And the next day we continued up the river and went through the first of the barrages, which is a, a dams, which you have to go through locks to raise you up into the river. And then we came across a blockage in the river. The whole river was blocked by Nile hyacinth plant and there was no way through it. And we backtracked about a mile to a, a village and asked the locals. The locals had told us it's miles and miles of this thick hyacinth plant. So desperate in a way to get to Cairo, um, we used Sammy's skills, I used his skills again and in a small smoking room which was full of guys around with rag heads on and smoking shisha pipes, we negotiated a, a rough truck and with as many hands as could be found from the local village they literally threw the dinghy in the back of this truck. In the shorter period of time I took the mast down and we were off to Cairo. That's the point where Jules joined the trip once again. Then we headed south and it was the first 200 miles, I think 150, 200 miles we needed to get before we could start and use the River Nile as a drinking source. Although it sounds a bit strange to drink the River Nile, we were advised by a doctor that if we were to take a small nip of Nile each day, we would soon build up the antibodies in our system. Well, yes, you're right, this is the Nile and we do use it for drinking up here in Aswan. As you can see, what I'm doing is uh, just collecting it up from the Nile into this basic filter and then the water just sifts through the bottom end and then goes into the jerry can. What this does really is just take out the roughage, uh, any large lumps etc floating down and then the rest of it's nice and clear. The beauty of the Nile captured us a lot. There was a lot of wild birds and bird life and uh, because we were under sail it was so peaceful and we could get all the scenery as it's going by, the farmers and all the oxen and the water buffalo and things like that and the egrets and uh, in the beautiful sort of floodplains on uh, the banks of the Nile. It was absolutely, it was just like going back to biblical times the whole way up.
As we got further and further south, we started bumping into more and more of the beautiful feluccas. And I just couldn't help but fall in love with these boats. They were around about 25 feet long. They're not so very big, single lateen sailed. And they were started to find ones which were taking tourists up and down the river from Edfu, up, down, up and down to Aswan. And a few days before we arrived at Aswan, we bumped into a specific uh, feluca that we were sailing. He was sailing with his mate back to Aswan with no tourists on board. And it seemed that our boats were sailing at approximately about the same speed. And so we were sailing sort of only a few meters apart. And so we started to get to uh, chatting. And of course, because he had been dealing with tourists, he could speak English, his game was NASA. He was a really nice guy. And um, as we were sailing along, he kind of was curious because he'd never seen a modern sailing boat like a Wayfarer. The next day, we agreed that we would swap boats. And Jules stayed on my boat and uh, NASA came on board the Wayfarer. And for the very first time, I skippered an ancient Egyptian felucca. And he trusted me and I trusted him and we both sailed each other's boats uh, fairly close to each other but the winds were getting up and we were screaming down the river against the current itself. It was really quite dramatic and from that point on I think it was first seeded into my head this could be a really good business proposition back on the island of Lefkas. So from that point on I started to get more and more fascinated by the feluccas and of course when we arrived at Aswan it was a wash with them. There must have been about 150 sails glancing about between the little rocky islands there. It was absolutely glorious. And it was then, of course, that I drew the plans of what was to become my own felucca, which was going to be called Aisha, named after the Ryder Haggard books, She Who Must Be Obeyed. After Christmas and um, coming into New Year, um, Kim uh, Baselman, she joined the trip and the plan was that she would join me from Aswan all the way back to Alexandria. And the journey back north was very different to the journey back up. Although we were passing the same stretch of rivers, the season had changed and now we were getting into uh, late winter, uh, early spring. Well, today it's the 8th of February and you can see it's a bit uh, chill in the air and uh, we're sailing at the moment near uh, the Naga Kamadi barrage which we're sailing up to now. It's probably about a mile, mile and a half ahead of us and uh, as you can see behind me the mountains of the eastern desert here in Egypt as we're sailing on this quite crisp February morning. Further down the river, around about Middle Egypt, um, we had stopped into the Nile River Police, which we were ordered to do. Every 100, 200 miles, there were Nile Police check stations. Um, and we had to basically sail with these guys for about a week. Uh, every night we'd stop on the riverbank together, and they'd get a little fire going. We would make our own food and things like that. And in the end, we got to know them really well. They were good fun. What was really fascinating, um, especially in Middle Egypt, you come across these really giant feluccas, these boats which were basically designed for cargo carrying. And uh, there is a tiller, and that tiller was actually made of a telegraph pole. So you've got to imagine a tiller made of a telegraph pole. And then even the rudder was nearly as big as our little boat, our little wayfarer. But they're often just managed by two old boys and uh, some young little lad. When we got back to Cairo, it was rather great. We got back, to, it, was, it was quite a, quite a milestone, if you like, getting back to this great city, one of the largest cities in Africa. Okay, here we are coming into the city centre of Cairo on this day 21st of February, really windy. And there you have 
the first bridge that we've got to negotiate under. And then only about half an hour from here we'll be at the Cairo Yacht Club right in the center, the heart of Cairo itself. Part of the journey that I did alone was um, probably one of the most scary ones for me. I was uh, right at the end of the River Nile on the entrance of the Mediterranean. Uh, Kim had just left uh, to go back to Aswan, so I only had a very short part to sail, only 30 miles to get to Alexandria, but there was a huge barrier in front of me and that was the shore break at the entrance of the River Nile. And I was stuck there looking at these ginormous white breaking waves. The very morning uh, that I did actually get out of uh, the River Nile into the Mediterranean, I remember it was about five o'clock in the morning. There was a huge commotion outside of the tent. And I was on the beach just outside of the customs shed. And suddenly loads of talk and shouting and screaming. And this, as I poked my head out of the tent, I saw fishermen running with their paperwork trying to get the stamps of approval to get out into the open Mediterranean. And I was noticing some of the very first boats that were breaking through the surf and they were big boats over 70 to 80 feet long. And I could see the very first wave would actually crash right over the top of the wheelhouses. And I still was thinking, this is impossible. But the customs guys who I'd got to know, they said, Mr. Steve, Englishman Steve, you must come now. And this is the chance to get out. And uh, they had arranged a small fishing boat to actually tow me through the waves, which I thought was great, very sensible thing, as there was no wind in the morning at all. So all of this got done. I had my paper stamped quickly and I was under tow by this boat, which was about 30 foot long. Uh... A run, more or less out. Captain's hesitating, he doesn't like the look of this. Uh, he might be uh, searching for another boat to give me a, a tow for the last bit, I'm not sure. But uh, just up ahead is the line of breakers. And then all of a sudden, about 100 meters before the first breaking waves, they let go my tow rope turned around and made gestures like the waves are too big for them, they're not going out. And so I would say, well, what about me? I'm half your size. And so, but they didn't listen. They just steamed back against the river. Of course, they had engines. I didn't. So I was at the mercy of the current of the Nile. And the only thing I could do was to prepare as best I could for the first of the three sets of breaking waves. And I remember being really nervous but with the oars I could position the boat so that it was smack on to the first wave, which broke right over the boat, filled the boat up with water. Um, the boat was then very unstable. The boat rose to the second wave and most of the water flew out of the back because I was at such a steep angle and broke again. And then finally, the third wave, fortunately for me, didn't break. And so I just glided over the top of it and then I was in the Mediterranean. I was shaking and there I was bailing the boat out like a maniac with a bucket and then the pump. And then eventually when I calmed down, then I could get under the sail. And it took me all day then to sail the 30 odd miles down the coast, eventually back to the safety of Alexandria Harbour. <laughs> Well, we're just about ready to leave Alexandria. We've got Leon sorted out. Joe's just waiting on board. We're just waiting for the Coast Guard to give us the clearance. Well, myself and Joe, when we left Alexandria on the way back up again, of course it was, um, it was now April, yeah. so it was a lot cooler. 
I was uh, um, sailing on the first night at sea and Joe was just having a nap and everything and then I saw this huge tanker go past so close it must couldn't be more than from here to the edge of Scorpius away and it was just horizon to horizon so I thought I've got to wake Joe up to see this and I said look at this boat <laughs> and you said what boat oh my god that <laughs> boat <laughs> was huge it was just like in your face oh from yeah. horizon to horizon you know yeah. well what we got here at the moment is uh Right out on the horizon we've got a fog bank which uh, has been sat out there now for about four hours. We've been becalmed here for five hours now waiting for something to happen. We've taken the main down because it was flogging over our heads. Um, I think by the time the sun sets we should get a wind. It's just a question of whether we get a beat to Cyprus. And I think the scariest moment must have been when we were stuck in fog. Yeah. Yeah. because there was no wind yeah. there was no way we could uh, go anywhere I mean where to go yeah. so I think we just cooked a big meal didn't yeah, we? Yeah I think so well, we can't do anything else we may as well eat. Well, we usually <laughs> <do>. <laughs> cooked a big meal and uh, had some wine yeah. and then all of a sudden slowly the fog oh. sort of um, went and then the wind started to pick up yeah. and that was the last mm -hmm. last night because that went into the evening then mm -hmm. and then we were really moving up on Cyprus and uh, I remember going through the night and we were screaming in on a, on a course mm. and I was getting up on the bow wasn't I and looking could up see light, could see and we see, see if we could see the lighthouse of Paphos you know because yeah, yeah. we no were scanning the horizon to see where this lighthouse was, was and then all of a sudden I remember seeing it and I said it's there right in front I couldn't believe yeah. it it was yeah. right Absolutely in front of us on the nose, on the nose yeah. wasn't it yeah. Yeah. and it was yeah. eight hours later we were in harbour and what a beautiful landfall that was and such a joy too. The port police were just the most wonderful people. Within five minutes, we'd stamped into Cyprus and free to go down to the cafe and have a good coffee. Fantastic. <laughs> Remember our journey from Cyprus to um, to Turkey. I had a flight booked from Turkey you to get did, back to join Orbis. Yeah. So we had to sort of. Um, it was one of the very few times. It was there yeah. and getting out of the River Nile that I felt the only two times on the whole journey I felt under pressure for time. Yeah. We were given by RAF Akateri, weren't they? They mm -hmm. were really good. They, so they gave us the weather mm -hmm. forecast and they said, "Guys, you've got 48 hours, yeah. if you remember, to yeah. get to Turkey before a storm's coming in." So I'd worked it out, said, okay, 48 hours, we've got 140 something odd miles to go. Okay, it can be done. So we went for it. But the trouble was, through the night, the wind veered. So it set us off our direct course. Right. So then we ended up with a direct beat for about 70 miles. And I Absolutely. worked it, worked the timing out, said, we're not going to make it. So that was when I executed plan B, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I remember saying to Joe, I says, right, we're going to take a 90 degree turn here, we're going to go straight off to Alanya. And I said, didn't I say something wild like, I think I'd have you in, in a safe harbour by midnight? Something like that. Something crazy like that, yeah. 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 Ooh, we Which made we, it, we just, made it. About. Just, just about. Just yeah. about, yeah. But this was the joyous sight that uh, brought us in. During the day we were sailing in at great speed and there we could see the snow-capped mountains of the Taurus Mountains on Turkey as we were sailing in and making our landfall in Alanya. Believe it or not, that looks so close, but it's not. That was sometime in the afternoon. It, we wouldn't get back into the harbour and to be safe until nearly just after midnight that same day. But we were pleased to get in because the next day, sure as the forecast was correct, bang, the storm hit. I've never seen anything like it. The size of the waves coming into the harbour and over the harbour wall there. To be honest with you, we felt pretty vulnerable, even though we were tucked up right inside this harbour. And we spent quite an uneasy night the next night um, with all our wet weather gear on, we couldn't sleep at all because we were in danger of the boat drifting its anchors and smashing into the harbour walls, etc. 
There's an old cliche they sometimes say it's safer to be at sea than it is to be too close to the coast when a storm hits. But when you're in a small dinghy like we had, um, to be honest with you, I was still happy to be in the harbour. Another part of the journey which I did on my own was um, the, most of the Turkish coast from the very south uh, uh, west corner of um, southern Turkey in the Lycian coast and it was after Jo had left the journey and went back to her work so I had to head north to a place called Bites near Bodrum and it was an enjoyable time. I was beating to windward up the coast, there were some good winds that allowed me to get out onto the trapeze and enjoy some really good open sailing. I um, saw lots of dolphins on that way up, um, there were some beautiful harbours and in the end, although it sometimes is said that the Turkish coast can be extremely windy and quite dangerous at times, I found it to be all manageable and really enjoyed the flat seas and strong, strongest sort of winds were enabled to, to really let the wayfarer loose and she got her legs on and really flew up that coast. Well the idea that I had with me ever since uh, Aswan of building an Egyptian felucca came to reality when I eventually got to Bites in the, up the Turkish coast. And it was then that I engaged with some Turkish friends and found a shipyard that was willing to build this rather strangely shaped boat, very wide, very shallow, and to their amazement with a hole in the bottom where a centerboard would go, which they'd never incurred before. And even to the day while we were building it, the Turkish shipyard was convinced the boat would sink when we put it in, for the water would come gushing into the boat. But um, together, it was a lovely three month period uh, where I kept the boat at Bites and each day I would travel to the shipyard on the famous Turkish Dolmush, which is uh, the little mini buses, which by its name says a, a stuffed bus. It would take us down to the shipyard and then I would work there all hours you know, to the day to the evening, come back to Bites, shower and sleep on the wayfarer and then the next day continue. So it was a major part of uh, the summer of 92 I spent in near Bodrum building the beautiful felucca called Aisha. So then it was time really to get the wayfarer back on the seas again and back to Lefkas. And that was a journey then that would take me across the Aegean Sea which is quite a notorious sea and I thought it'd be nice to do it with a crew member so I was looking around as to who was available. There was a guy called Mike who was a windsurf instructor. Uh, he was a bit skeptical about dinghy sailors and so it was rather nice to take him with me because uh, at the end of the trip he was certainly convinced that the Wayfarer was a really good boat to travel across seas in. We sailed off to cross the waters to Coz which is not a far distance about 10 miles or so where we spent the night there and then the next morning I seem to remember we reveled in a fantastic large breakfast and from there we set off uh, across island hopping really as a direct a route as we could make across the Aegean towards the Corinth Canal and so the first island was uh, Calamos just north of Cos and then there was a rather long sail from there to Amorgos but on the way we caught dinner which was rather nice we caught a the second fish of the whole journey. Can you imagine such a long journey and actually only caught two fish? It's a bit pathetic, really. Very far, final part of the journey, which uh, again I did uh, on my own, single-handed, was from Egina Island near Athens, where I just dropped off Mike. And uh, that took me again onto familiar territories, but uh, again, every day is a new day. And it took me towards uh, Corinth Canal, which is an amusing thing to get through because uh, they only allow you to go through the Corinth Canal if you have your own power. And of course, having only sail power or oars, and you have to maintain a minimum speed of four knots. So I went through this argument with the authorities once again and asked them if I could have permission to be towed through the canal by a yacht, if I could find a yacht that would allow me to do that. Eventually they sort of said, well, yes, you could if you can find such a yacht. But at first they wanted to tow me through with one of these massive tugs and charge me absolutely an extortionate amount of money. 
but in the end I still had to pay as much as a yacht and I did get a tow through eventually. From there I was sailing through the Gulf of uh, Corinth and that can be quite a windy place too and I had my fair share of quite strong winds going in that section of the sea. None of them so dramatic to be a danger of course and eventually through the Gulf of Patras and that brought me into a rather exciting period where I turned the corner back into the Ionian Sea and then I could smell home. It was not far away, only a few days sailing away and it was beautiful on the very return I had a pilot fish swimming just on my bow underneath the boat and it just led me straight back to Lefkas and it stayed with me for absolute hours and it was a little striped fish probably about a foot long and they do what pilot fishes do as the name suggests they pilot you in they come on the bow of a ship or bow of a bigger fish and um, I was just really pleased that that fish had taken the front position of my boat as I was coming in on the very final leg local people and friends got news that I was coming in and a whole fleet of little boats came out to welcome me in it was really nice One of my favourite quotes, and now one which is very appropriate to this trip, was by Christopher Columbus. You can never cross an ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the land. <laughs> 